what made you, you started sharing your testimony? Right. You know, people always ask about the book, and um, it was something that I had prayed about a lot and talked about with the Lord and said, you know, I know someday you're going to ask me to write my story. Um, and you know how hard that would be for me, especially because I have maintained such privacy over our lives in an effort to protect my children. <clears throat> and I really... I felt him asking me to write my story about two years ago. So you were talking to him about... Right. And, um, and I felt him promise me that um, there was beauty in it for our entire family. And it wasn't just about me sharing my story, but it was about giving hope to other people in their dark places. What do you think you read this book? Do you think it'll be people who are curious about your story, also people who are going through difficult times? What do you see the audience for? Um, I mean, I think it will run the gamut uh, of, as you said, people who are curious about my story, but also people that are going through, you know, a lot of struggle and uh, are searching for hope in the midst of that. Your background from reading the book, you grew up in Leicester County. Right. A lot of us probably have the same kind of experience. You're kind of shy, you said, when you were younger. Right. You're married at a young age, you at a younger age. Now, what's it like for you now to step onto a wider stage? You're about to release a book nationally, right. speaking to bigger groups. How does that feel to you? Is it, is it a natural progression to you? Is it feeling like a story to tell? You know, for me, it's not about telling a story for the sake of telling a story. I don't want to just be a momentary inspiration for someone, but I want to connect them to the love of God. And having a conversation at a restaurant or talking to a large group of people somewhere across the country, it's really not any different one to the other. The message is still the same. The venue is different, but the message is still the same. Well, you had to see some signs. I mean, I'm sure you've thought back to that many, many times. Oh, a million times. Yeah. Do, you, do you feel like this just came from like a, a sad place inside Charlie? or what? When I talked about it with the counselors, um, what was suggested to me was that we had years of untreated clinical depression after the loss of our daughter, you know, that showed themselves in periodic times of you know, being, him being withdrawn or seeming depressed, but that that... It was just for a couple of days. Yeah, time. yeah. That, that, those years of that led to a psychotic break. And then he also had... Um, we don't talk about this word. He had an incident he referred to family members. Right, you know, that was investigated thoroughly by the police, yeah. and they never found anything to support I know. that. What, what do you think, where do you think that came from? I just think that, you know, a lot of the things that he said in his phone call to me that day and in his letter just don't make any sense. And I don't know what was going on in his mind at the time, but since all of that was investigated thoroughly and the police never found anything of substance to back that up, I have to believe that it wasn't true at all. What, tell me a little bit about what, you know, I'm someone, like we talked about, I think her name was Dara, or there's yeah. a woman who had lost her husband, and yeah. somebody else you know, got to know yeah. a little bit. Um, so there's people who have those experiences every day, mm -hmm. something yeah. tragic that's happening. Yeah. What, what would you say to them about your experiences and maybe how they can learn from it and what they can take away from it, what happened to them? The thing that I found is that we all experience places of being in the valley. You know? We all experience of being in the valley. Yeah, that life is hard, and there are difficult things that happen in all of our lives. But when you're in that place in the valley, you can't stop and stay there. You have to keep walking and taking one step at a time and putting one foot in front of the other. And it's almost as if you can see the mountain in front of you and you can't understand how you'll ever make it up at the top. But by taking one step at a time, you eventually get to that place of looking down from the top of the mountain and realizing how far you've come.
you feel like you're on top of that now? No, you know, life doesn't let you stay there. Um, you're continually up and down. It's not like there's just one life experience that's difficult or trying. And, and so every day brings its own moments of being in the valley and being on top of the mountain. And it's just allowing yourself to move between the two of them. Um, and knowing that just as you can't stay in the valley, you're not going to stay at the top of the mountain either. In those early days, what, what do you think? Did you reach a point where you thought, this is the darkest day really? I don't know if I can work for it. You know, that idea of having to put one foot in front of the other. Did you think, this is it, I just can't do it anymore? Did your kids to think about? And you know, um, in the very first moment of the afternoon of the shooting, I knew that I was faced with two distinct choices. I could choose to believe that everything I had ever read in the Word and heard someone else testify to the Lord being was absolutely true, and that somehow He was going to rescue my family. Or I could choose to believe that if all of that was true, then none of this would have happened if we were going down like the fastest single ship. And I knew that I was in a place of complete desperation where I had nothing to cling to, and there was no risk in trusting the Lord. I had nothing to lose by trusting Him. And so I threw myself helplessly upon the feet of the Lord and asked Him to help me, and He did. And making that choice has directed every day of my life since. And I never wanted my kids to look back on that day and say, that was the day that my life ended. And so every day was an opportunity to get up and to so love and laugh into my kids and to find the goodness of the Lord. And it wasn't hard to find that. All we had to do was look for it. And to know that He was surrounding us and He was walking us through it and we were going to be okay. You know, seven years sometimes probably seems like yesterday. How, how do you frame that? I mean, when you think about it every single day, are there days that this is are there days that are not you don't think about it at all? How do you file that away? Um, I definitely think about it every day. There's no way to deny my life. Um, it doesn't haunt me. There are days that are difficult. And there are days that are beautiful. And there are days that are both of those things. Some people might, um, and this is a high observation, but some people might think that you know, they seem to be to, not to capitalize, but you know, to make some money on what happened to you, you know, kind of the way society sometimes reacts to things like this. Do you have any response to that? Do you think people might judge you for that, or does that worry you? You know, what people decide to think about me is really up to them. I'm focused on, you know, this is my story, and this is how I found the Lord, and this is how He's brought healing into my life, and that's the message that I want to share with other people who are going through their own times of pain, that this is not the end for them, and that there is beauty to be found on the other side of this, and there is a way to get through it, and not just survive, but to thrive.